All right, hey, good morning. So great to see you. Glad that you're here. We have uh, flipped the service around a bit. If you're here uh, regularly, you'll know that often the message comes a little later. I'm gonna set up our time today, special service of worship here on a Palm Sunday where we're gonna dive into scripture, we're gonna be singing. And our whole hope here is to set up Easter week. Y'all, this is it, this is it. Y'all know that, right? Palm Sunday is a big deal on the Christian calendar because it starts Holy Week. And, you know, we've been talking about Lenten season, how to focus, get focused. We started with Ash Wednesday and talking about ways we could fast, ways we could pray and all this stuff. And I'm guessing, just guessing, not unlike the beginning of a new year, where you get all your resolutions and you go to the gym twice. And I'm just guessing some of us, maybe you've not gotten yourself out of your regular rhythms and patterns. And uh, so now's the time. Okay, now is the time. That's what today's about, setting up the week to set sort of a pattern for you to practice then throughout the week. So uh, let's do it. What do you say? Uh, the whole focus of our time here is, is to understand the sufferings of Christ and what he walked through in his final week. And we're going to move towards Easter. It's going to be amazing. But uh, today's Palm Sunday. And so you can go ahead and grab your Bible. And as you note, uh, or if you've been here at all, you know we're in the book of Matthew. The book of Matthew, where we focus on, on Jesus as king and what kind of kingdom this is. And today we find him coming into Jerusalem for the last time. Um, I say that he'll come out to Bethany and, and, and about you know the outskirts there. But he'll be coming into Jerusalem essentially the last time. Uh, and he'll end up on a cross before the week is out. Um, we have a devotional guide, by the way, that uh, Rebecca can tell you more about others uh, as you go. Make sure you grab. I like the physical copy myself. It's online too. But um, grab one on your way out. Uh, in an incredible book, um, theologian N.T. Wright has written, it's called How God Became King. And in it, uh, he, he notes that, that, that a lot of us, particularly in modern Christianity, in the modern West, have got it wrong. We've missed the primary storyline of, of the Bible. Now, that's a bold statement, but he then backs it up to, to explain why he says this. And one of the things that he says is this. He says, the Gospels were all about God becoming king, but the creeds, okay, which came later and formed our doctrine and a lot of theology, are focused on Jesus being God. Now, now he is God, N.T. Wright notes as well. He is God but the big question becomes, what is this embodied God up to in the world? What is he doing? And this is the gospel, it's the ministry of Jesus. And then we are to then join him in what he's doing. We miss out on the most important questions, which are not just, well, Jesus, he's, he was God in the flesh, came, died on the cross so I can go to heaven someday and get beamed up someday. Yes, and we'll have that glory that's coming someday. When in reality, the New Testament and Jesus teaches us that, no, the kingdom came with him. It is here now, and we join him. I guess it's a lot easier to talk about creeds and theologies and ideologies and debate who's in, who's out, than it is to actually die to ourselves and live under the reign and rule of the king. And, and so there's probably no a greater moment or event that shows us uh, who is this king? What kind of king is he? Then the triumphal entry. And today you're going to see um, that Jesus is, he's, and we're going to sing about it. He's king over us. Uh, he is king for us. And he, he's a king who's with us. And so in Matthew 21, go ahead and turn to Matthew 21. Uh, our hope is that you'll just slow down and experience the peace of God that comes in the midst of our troubled and crazy lives that we live. The final week, as I set this up, the final week of Jesus' life takes up 29 chapters of the Gospels, of which are 80, there's 89 chapters total. In fact, if you look, find this story in the book of John, and this is what I'm doing this week, I wanna encourage you to do so. Read the Passion Narratives. It's, they're easy to find. To find the final way, they start with triumphal entry in all four Gospels. So go there, find them, and then read the rest of that Gospel. Do that this week, every one of the Gospels. Um, and then uh, what we see here, though, if you look in the book of John, for instance, uh, it starts in, in chapter 12 is where we find the triumphal entry. Anybody know how many chapters are in John? 21. Almost half the book is about the last week of Jesus' life. In Matthew, it's two-fifths of the entire book. In Mark, it's three-fourths. In Luke, it's one-third. 
clearly the last week of Jesus' life is central. In fact, you could argue it's where everything in all the scriptures pointing to this. In fact, four chapters of the gospels, I don't know if you ever thought about this, cover the first 30 years of his life. And then you got 20, uh, let's see, I think it's 21, no, 29 chapters then cover the last, no, it was 30, the, of the, the last, uh, th- what, thir- three years, three and a half years, 89, 89 chapters. That's what it covers, the last three and a half. And then, then 29 chapters cover the last week, as I noted. The final week of Jesus' life is the hinge point of all of history. This is why Palm Sunday is a big deal on the Christian calendar. We don't just rush to Easter. We stop and we celebrate the king who has come into Jerusalem this last time to to redeem us. And so much we can learn in this last week. It's central. In fact, Paul would say later, and it's often, you know, our, our focus here always. Paul would say later, I came and I didn't know anything among you except Christ and him crucified. That's all, that's all I've got. That's our story and we're sticking to it. And as a church, if you're a guest today, You need to know that we're all about Christ and what he's done for us on the cross. He's risen again and he is is Lord. He's reigning and ruling over us. And we have been forgiven. The cross and him crucified is our message. And that's the center of our story today. So Matthew chapter 21, beginning with verse one. Now, when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethphage, to the Mount of Olives, so this is a, if you've been to Jerusalem, it's a hill looking over the city. Then Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go into the village in front of you and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say the Lord needs them and he will give them at once. Now, clearly Jesus is directing something here. He's staging something, in fact, and he needs one prop. He needs a donkey. So he sends his stage hands to go get the donkey and come on, we're going to do this. What is he orchestrating here? Look at, look at verse four. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet saying, say to the daughter of Zion, that's an idiom for the Jewish people, behold, your king is coming to you, humble mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of the beast of burden. That's straight out of Zechariah 9.9. All four gospels, by the way, not only have this story, but they all quote Zechariah 9.9. And then look, look at verse six. The disciples went and did as Jesus has directed. As crazy as this request is, and the fact that he's directing all this, like you you just ask for it and and whoever you come upon, they're gonna go like, okay, you know, whatever. Like he's directing everything. And as crazy as the request is, even the disciples go, okay, we'll go get a donkey. And so notice, that's the first thing I want you to see. Jesus is directing everything here. So I say it this way, King Jesus is over us. And today, friends, we all need to remember this. In light of what's happening in our world, and I could just only imagine what's happening in your world, that the thing that you need more than anything in your life The thing I pray over people as a pastor more than anything is peace and rest. What do you need more than soulful gospel rest in your life right now? And Jesus is coming to bring it and he is king and he is over us. You need to remember that he's in control of all things. He's sovereign over your life. History is moving in a linear fashion towards the end and the purposes of God being accomplished, not only in the universe, but in your life as well. Be encouraged today. The triumphal entry reminds us that Jesus, he's over us and his purposes will not be thwarted. Look at verse seven. They brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks and he sat on them. Now them, the cloaks, all right? Um, And there's, by the way, the other gospel writers say one donkey. Some have, there's a lot. There's, uh, there's, you can 
I could offer an hour of what people think about this, but he's not going to rodeo. Like he's not riding two donkeys, you know, like the, like the girls do or something. Um, he's, he's on one donkey and they put their cloaks on him and most of the crowd spread their cloaks. It's like throwing down our, our jackets or whatever else, clothes down, rolling out the red carpet. That's what it is. Others cut branches because they didn't, they're not, like, they don't have much to throw down. They threw down from the trees, the, the palm branches and spread them out on the road. Here's what's happening. Jesus has orchestrated this thing and it now mocks or simulates a parade of a victorious king coming in after conquering another nation. Philip Yancey in a great book called The Jesus I Never Knew imagines a Roman soldier coming upon this scene because the whole city is stirred and, and there's this crowd now coming around Jesus. And he's coming in Jerusalem. So he, he imagines, and this could, could have happened just like this, but it helps us understand this. The, the Roman soldier shows up and he's kind of like, wait, what is this crowd? Like, we got to settle this. What's happening? Bust out his spear. What is going on here? And he, he has seen an actual vic- victory parade like this done right. The conquering king would come in. He would probably, you know, there'd be shields and swords and chariots flashing in the sunlight. There'd be, he'd be on a stallion probably with a host of not only spoils of war, but also following them would be prisoners of war chained up as if to say, mess with us. This is what happens to you. And they're coming in. The people are, yes, we have won the victory. And this is our king leading the way. The Roman soldier makes his way through the crowd trying to find out what is, going, who, what is happening. We should have known about this, what, what's going on. And he sees man, he sees a grown man on a little, not like the donkey we have here on campus, by the way, today, go pet the donkey, but not, not an American donkey. You know, donkeys had nationalities, but not a, it, it, it was little, it was a baby donkey. This is awkward is what I'm saying. And then as we'll see here in a moment, Luke tells us he's weeping. A Roman soldier, what? It would have been laughable to him. This is not the way kings come in. This is not my kind of king. And for many of us, we could say the same. This is not my kind of king. I want a king who's powerful, powering up on people, taking people down. That's what I want. That's the American king. This king shows us something differently. He shows us the way of Jesus. Look at verse 9. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna, the son of David. This, this Hosanna is, it literally means rescue us, save us. It was really a proclamation. Like we kind of say hallelujah, praise be to God. But it's, it was a proclamation of praise and adoration. And son of David, that's a direct, focused, um, you know, uh, an idiom or, 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 or label that's placed on the Messiah. They get it, evidently. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And, and this, this son of David designated him as the conquering king. So what I want you to see here is this. Triumphal entry. He's coming in. Not only is Jesus over us, but this king, Jesus, is for us. He is for us. There's a theological term in Latin um, pro nobis, which is, means God is for us. God is for us and he's for you today. He wants the best for you. And in verse 10, look at this. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up saying, who is this? And the crowd said, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. Okay. Again, who is, wait, is he a prophet? Is he son of David? Cause if that's the case, he's Messiah. We may not fully understand what this Messiah is all about, but who is he? It kind of echoes forth into, uh, into this place today. The words of Jesus, who do you say I am? There are a lot of opinions. By the end of the week, they're going to be yelling, crucify him. He's a thief. He's blasphemous. He's all that. Well, who is he? Who is he to you? That's the key question, right? He's over you. He's over us. He's for us. And finally, he's, he's with us. He has come to live among us, to dwell among us. And again, Luke offers this detail. Look at how he so empathizes. You're going to hear this a lot during our service today and in our singing. He's a son of suffering. It says, as he approached Jerusalem and he saw the city, he wept over it. 
and said, if you, even you had only known of this day, what would bring peace? But now it is hidden from your eyes. Most people are going to miss him. Within 40 years, we know this, uh, there's going to be an insurrection that takes place, about a four-year insurrection in Jerusalem with, up against the Roman, Roman government. They're going to shut it down. They're going to destroy Jerusalem, 70 AD, and the temple, which is wild when you think about it. Jesus, the once and only for all time sacrificial lamb, gives his life on the cross. Bam, the entire temple religious system is broken down because it's no longer needed. And Jesus knows this is coming. And he is weeping. Why does Jesus weep? He weeps for, for three reasons. He weeps over people. He weeps over cities with have people in it. And he weeps over the fact that we will not receive his peace. We reject his peace. He so wants us to experience his peace. Many of you know the shortest verse in the Bible. Anybody know what it is? What is it? Jesus wept. Anybody know where, where it's found? That's okay. Y'all have memorized that verse, though. That's, that's really good. Y'all memorized. Jesus wept. Uh, it's in John eleven thirty five, 35, because I looked look at it earlier. And, and it, it's, it's where, of course, it's where Lazarus, you know, has died. Jesus, in that case, he's dying because of empathy towards his friends, Martha and Mary. He so empathizes with us, and he weeps with us. He joins you in your sadness and in your weeping. He is, he's with you. He weeps over uh, the fact that we weep. He, he weeps again here, and he weeps in the garden. He's overwhelmed with distress. It's implied there, but it says he's so deeply distressed and filled with anxiety, and he's, he's deeply sorrowed. Why? Not because of the nails that are going to go through his wrist and his feet. He's, he's, he's overwhelmed by the fact that he's about to take on the very wrath of God, holy, God's holy reaction to sin. He hates sin. Jesus is going to take it all on himself so that we don't have to. But he's saying, if only you knew the peace that I have to offer to you. And it so much wants us to experience. He's weeping like, you're not, many aren't going to get it. I'm about to go to the cross. I'm about to die. And so many of you today, we need peace today, don't we? And yet the Palm Sunday tells us, it shows us that there are these coexisting realities of grief and hope, of strength and weakness. How about this, of death and life. And here comes this king like no other. And so what I want you to see as we enter into this time of worship, to really engage your hearts, to come to Jesus, come to him. Not just know, oh yeah, if I came to him, then I'd find peace. No, 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 you have to come to him. In order to, because here it is, C.S. Lewis said it. You come to God for peace because apart from him, it doesn't exist. But you have to come to him. And if you've never received Christ, today is your day. If you have, like many of us, uh, to receive his, the work he's done on the cross for us, you come to him today in worship and say, Lord, I, bring, I lay down all of my burdens. I lay down my grief. We've lost so much over the past two years. I just continue to lay, I lay my anxieties and my worries before you. Come to him. That's what this service is designed to do. So I want you to see this. Jesus, watch this, he weeps over you. He weeps over you. He, he, he weeps for you. Even now, he intercedes for us. His presence is with us. We often say at a graveside, I'll often say at a funeral, grief is the price we pay for love. The greater the love, the greater the grief. And Jesus so loves us, he grieves when we don't come to him. Today, we have opportunity before this holy week really kicks in. It starts today, yes, but to say, well, I'm, I'm coming to you. I'm coming to you. And then and finally, he weeps with you. He, he, he is with us. So much so that Paul wants us to remember that even death itself, he says, I don't want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, that, 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 about those who've died, who've fallen asleep. Because we don't grieve as those who have no hope. We grieve as those who have hope. We can grieve, but we can also have hope that keeps us pressing on. We're longing for, we're hungering for a better world. Everybody knows it. Believer or not, the world is broken. 
We're longing for another word, thirsting for a world to come. We're like a fish out of water, gasping for air. We know that this is not the way it's supposed to be. So even in our grief, it's an expression of faith. This is not the way it's supposed to be. But watch this. Not, not, it's not, well, let's wait on heaven then. No, 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 no. We come to him now and we bring his kingdom with us as we care and love others and, and, and serve the world and tell them about Jesus, who is himself, Ephesians 2, 14, our peace. Jesus is our peace. We must come to him to experience it. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to, let's just bow our heads and close our eyes for a moment. And then Han's going to come and really help frame this time as we move together. I want you to engage your hearts in, in worship with him. Let it set the tone for the coming week. Because the question that I want to challenge you with is this. So he, he's, he's over us. He, he's for us. He's with us. But here's the question for us. Are you for him? Are you pro-Jesus? And do people know it? Do they hear it? Do they see it in your life? And how about this? Are you with him? Do you come to him? And if you don't come to him in prayer, in the word, if you don't focus on him and, and call out to him, come to him, no wonder you experience so much anxiety and worry. He said, peace is not found apart from me. So Lord, we come to you now. I pray for everyone here that we will lay our burdens at, at your feet today. That we will lay our anxieties and our worries at the cross. And all that we grieve to acknowledge it. Acknowledge our loss of relationships or literally loss of life, loss of jobs, loss of all that has been the past couple of years and even in recent days. And we come to you now. Come to me, he says. All who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest.